Tom, thanks for joining. My pleasure. Um, so I consider myself a bit of a geek. Uh, I've known you for what, three hours or so, and uh, I recognize a geek when I see one. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, so you spend a lot of time thinking about data, AI, but also talking to companies, kind of, um, companies are probably experts, industry leaders on this, on this topic. Um, what is kind of the, I was wondering, the the most intriguing question on your mind in this field? Oh my goodness, that's a big question. Um, for me, the, the biggest challenge is reconciling the incredible opportunities that we have and the extraordinary things that technology can do. Um, and then the reality of people and organizations. So whenever I work with a big company, individually, people are incredible. Individually, people are expert, they're well-intentioned, they work hard. You put all of these people together in a company and things get really messy. You know, most, most companies have to deal with cultures that are not great with change. They have to deal with legacy technology that they can't make a business case to change. So by far the hardest and the most kind of wonderful thing I have to do is to kind of plot this line between possibility and what's realistic. You know, what can you rethink? Um, how big a risk can you take? How do you make the business case for this change? Um, and that's why I'm really interested to, to meet you and talk to you guys, because this is what you're doing. You know, I'm quite often the provocateur. I go in and I say, couldn't the world be amazing? What if we thought this way? Um, and then normally I get to leave before I have to do that much about it. Um, so I'm always interested to know in your position what it's like. Like how, how, how do you take the possibilities of technology and turn that into a real action plan? Yeah. Yeah. So it's indeed finding the trade-off or striking kind of the right balance between staying pragmatic and a bit eyes on also short or medium term opportunity versus going, going towards that vision or dot on the horizon, right? The big promise. Yeah. Uh, because ideally you move as a company to that big promise. We can all reinvent our business with AI or whatever, but it's often, a, and it's, it's not easy to, to paint that picture, but sometimes it's possible, but then it's only a picture, uh, and you'll, you will only get there step by step. So how do you chop it up in steps that you can actually take realistically? Like yeah. where do you start and how do you scope it? Yeah. Um, and typically, um, it boils down to a, I would say a fairly standard approach of defining value pools within that use cases and doing that in a smart way. So making a smart assessment about what is the possible or the potential impact of these use cases, how feasible are they? And then kind of doing a, a, a common sense prioritization, but that's only like the very first step. And then, it, then it's the next step is, I think that is also what what we have, uh, what we partner on with uh, with our clients, is how do you then, on a first prioritized use case, go the whole journey from conception to MVP to scaling it uh, and to changing the business along with it, right? So in such a way that it doesn't come become kind of this new fancy thing, mm -hmm. as you also talk about it, that we put on top of a process or on top of a business, yeah. but that it is actually integrated in your processes and the, and, and, and the process changes. So um. there's always this really interesting tension, I think, between the kind of fancy and frivolous and new and exciting technology and actually the, the degree to which really profound change comes from things that are very boring. You know, so, so anything that you can take a photograph of gets the client's imagination. So a picture of a drone looks very exciting. Um, a picture of a kind of robot looks very exciting. I mean, actually quite a lot of companies can be really transformed by people using collaborative software um, or a better use of microservices layers or um, a better way to run meetings. You know, quite often the most profound technology doesn't look very interesting as an item. Um, so I always find it quite hard to sort of balance the sort of sexy with the profound and the stuff that can happen quickly and looks good in the company report and the thing that may take five or 10 years. Yeah. You know, I, I, for me, like technical debt is a huge problem um, because it's very hard to get people really excited um, about changing the foundations of a company when often you can't see those things. Yeah. And um, on that, sometimes um, kind of the first step 
is changing a process using data and maybe not even very sophisticated AI, but make some data-driven common sense decisions. And that could be a, a first step out of which you then become more sophisticated. Do you think you need to kind of f walk before, before you can run or could you actually just start doing the marathon uh, right from the start? It's a very good question. I think it probably depends a lot on the business itself and their culture. Um, there are times when if you aim too far, you end up losing people. But there are times where if you don't aim to be um, ambitious enough, by the time things get scaled back, it becomes very incremental. Um, it's always quite interesting for me because I trained to be an architect rather than something in technology. And for me, physical infrastructure and company infrastructure have a very similar parallel. You know, there are times when you look at an airport and you think rather than adding in a porter cabin and building a new terminal, we should probably just build an airport that's brand new in a completely different place. And I find that balance between incremental changes to course correct, which are easier to justify the capital for, which carry less risk, which can be done more quickly, that people can get on board with more quickly. Um, I find that to be the solution that people defer to. And normally that means that people work very, very hard just to maintain something that's not quite as good as it can be. So it's interesting for me when you get a technology that's developing as rapidly as AI, because the, the growth curve of possibility is so rapid um, it almost becomes easier to justify something which is bolder and more ambitious because you can do something with it now and the value that it adds can be so great. Um, but it's difficult. Like, like people, people are not good with taking risks. People are not good with something that can't be quantified. The cost of doing nothing um, is often thought to be zero when in fact it's quite expensive. Um, how, how, do you, um, how do you motivate people to take a risk and to invest in these new ways of doing things? Um... Usually, um, well, part of it is obviously the business case, right? That's by far the most important thing. And it should be a business case that is that has a sufficient amount of realism to it. <laughs> uh, because lofty business cases are easy, right? Back of the envelope, you can all, all, uh, all make one. And then it helps to have experience in actually developing these use cases all the way up until like the point that it is really embedded, implemented, scaled in an organization because then you actually learn what it takes to get there to get the impact out of it just you know uh, uh, having the wheels uh, running yeah um, that helps in the next time that you are in the beginning of such a cycle uh, to make a realistic estimate of not what is the theoretical potential but how much do we actually think we can get from it yeah. um, and being able to explain that uh, gives both the the inspiration about the opportunity and sufficient tangibility around the realism, those together, obviously, um, for an executive yeah. is the recipe for saying, okay, uh, let's do it. Does it limit your ability to be incredibly ambitious? What I mean by yes. this is yes, it's it very hard to quantify the value of doing something that's never been done before. It does. And then it depends, I think, on for certain leaders, uh, the ones that dare to take a leap and are a bit more, you know, willing to take risk, yeah. uh, have a drive to innovate in their industry. Those are the ones that, yeah, I mean, it's like the old Apple slogan, right? <laughs> uh, the people that dare to, what is it? Dare to think different or whatever it was. Nice um, those are the, the, the business leaders that, uh, yeah, that, that stretch the boundaries. This event is obviously mainly focused on AI, um, but AI is a lever for accomplishing more. Um, are there particular elements or aspects to AI that you're most interested in personally or most inspired by? Obviously, everything around generative AI now is... So I'm curious by nature. Uh, I've always been curious about technology. And so what I like about AI, what, what people also say about AI, AI, it's anything that doesn't work yet or anything that is not yet very clear. Uh, once it is cleared, I also tend to lose interest a little bit because then I know, I know how it works, right? <laughs> then it's like, okay. Um, so this whole new wave of generative AI is actually for me a candy store because there's there are so many unknowns yeah. and there's so many there's so much stuff to still still be found out. Uh, at the same time, what I'm inspired by is not so much the technology per se, but what you can do with it. So in that sense, we're now kind of at the change from what we now call traditional AI or predictive AI, which is basically machine learning predicting quant uh, quantitative values, to a whole new class, which is uh, generative AI. Um, and yes, I'm interested, I would say still in both, where the, this new class 
uh, it catches my attention because it has all these new promises, you know, up until autonomous agents and autonomous, autonomous organizations. But apart from the technology, what, is, what I also wonder is, to what extent are we done with the first wave, right? So we now call traditional or predictive AI. Um, and if I look at most organizations, they are still a long way from uh, capturing the value from that. Yeah. And now everybody is all over the moon with this new sexy thing. Um, so there is, you could say, too much focus on the hype and the technology because in the end of the day, that's not what it is about. It is about what you do with it and how you change your organization with it. And you should not separate these classes. Actually, I think in most use cases, they blend yeah. and they work together. And it's about systems thinking and how do you use different technologies you know, to create a new possibility, to, I don't know, innovate the way you serve your customers or how you run your processes or whatever it is. A very interesting time, I think, because every time there's a new demo or a new launch from an AI company, um, it seems completely magical. It seems completely extraordinary. Um, but sometimes it doesn't seem that helpful. Um, so I'm really interested to know what happens in the next year when people like you or I are comfortable enough with what this technology means um, to start I don't know, kind of bringing together user needs, bringing together companies' needs, and then bring together the technology and to kind of make a much better way to do things. At the moment, it seems very pushed by Silicon Valley. You know, it's kind of like um, a metaphorical laboratory with people wearing white coats, kind of producing yep. a formula. Yep. You know, I'm, I'm fascinated to know what we're going to cook with it. And yeah. What does it taste like? Yeah, so that's the smoke and mirrors that I, tend, <laughs> that, that I tend to talk about. Yeah. And it's very hard for people. I mean, we're in the field, right? Uh, I read about it daily. Maybe I spend an hour per day reading about this stuff. And even I have like still many open questions or I'm confused. So let alone people that don't have spent that much time on it. Um, and this whole promise, if you think about the, the large language models that are now, uh, that are out there, uh, this whole promise of, for instance, automating customer service, right? And we've all seen, I think, the, the Klarna case. You've probably <laughs> seen it. Yes, I know, yeah. They automated 700 agents yeah. or whatever. Um, and what I wonder, and actually, I, I don't have insights into the case, but what I would like to know is, if, is it actually a very sophisticated Q&A engine, right? A sophisticated chatbot? Or did they really integrate into the backend? Yes. You know, does the chatbot talk to the backend systems? Does it, does it solve problems? I, I don't know. This is the question, though. I think um, people are so quick to adopt these things. It's become a kind of a UX layer. And actually, it's the system below that really matters. Yes. You know, it's great to talk to a chatbot and it sounds like a human, but can it actually have the power to refund me? Yes. Um, it's great to have a chatbot that tells you if your flight's running on time, but does it let me change yeah. to a different flight? Yeah. Um, and it's fascinating because it's the stuff beneath the surface of the iceberg, which is where these things either completely transform the world and they can they give us better experiences than we've ever had before and they stop us having to phone up a call center and wait for 30 minutes or they just become another thing to get frustrated with before we have to pick up the phone and do it a different way yeah. it's, it's a very interesting time i think yeah so we we're talking about chatbots and uh, i think uh, the the real level of um, what is the really the state of the art yes yeah? and whether it's more than an interface whether it's actually technology that is able to integrate with with other systems and, and interact and carry out tasks, etc. Um, and part of that obviously is also uh, the whole question around manageability and performance bounds on these uh, on these agents. Have you come across what is what is your view on that at the moment if you look at different companies applying this technology in a in a real real customer facing setting? Um, we are very early on in this, and I think um, companies have been very quick to embrace this because they think they can save a lot of money. Um, so we can talk about Klarna and their apparent success so far. We could also talk about you know Air Canada um, having a hallucinating uh, chatbot. Um, we can talk about lawyers that are going into cases you know badly prepared. Um, this brings home to me something which I'm really really passionate about which is that these decisions shouldn't be driven by the CFO. Um, they should be driven by someone more like the CMO. Like technology is always a lever to get more out. Um, and AI is an amazing lever to our humanity and our brains and our empathy. And I don't want people to put less in and then multiply it to get the same out. 
And I don't want people to put nothing in and get very little out. I want people to put the same energy or more into this and get even more out. So it can't be how can we have uh, chatbots do our jobs. It should be how can technology make people who do customer service be even better at their jobs? Yeah. How can it listen to conversations and suggest information to, to assistants? How can it automatically do the mundane work in the background? How can we keep humans in the loop? Um, how can we do what we've always done with technology? Technology has always made our jobs better and more valuable and more human by being a lever to us. So the ATM meant that people who were handing out money all day got to have conversations with clients and probably upsell them on a mortgage. Um, how can we use this to make sure that we do better work rather than stuff cheaper and faster? What's, what's your vision for AI? Is that, you know, Rewire has been very, very quick to embrace this technology uh, and to really understand what it means. What's your vision? How do you see everything going? Interesting question. So I think the, the divide between the technology and the pace of change in organizations is going to increase, unfortunately. So um, there's a lot, lot of talk about the pace of change when it comes to generative AI and the fact that it will uh, come to market faster than traditionally new technologies have done. And I think there is some truth to it because the infrastructure is there, which was, for instance, we talk about now traditional AI, um, 10 years ago or so, all these algorithms already existed, right? You, you could just also uh, build a, an XG boost model with a flick of the switch. Um, however, the, the infrastructure to implement those algorithms at scale in an organization and bet them in a process was not, not yet there. So there wasn't kind of a road uh, a vehicle or a vessel for AI to uh, yeah, to diffuse in organizations. That is, by and large, most or most large organization is is there now, right? So there's a there's like a fertile ground for new Gen AI in this case to land in. So yes, that will go faster. Um, but like we've touched on, um, it's it's much more kind of the fundamental change in terms of how organizations work, operate, and how they create value, that is going to be the real change. And that is real, st still going to be uh, hard work uh, and requires creativity in terms of rethinking um, how we can deliver value to our customers and how, how to change our systems and, and operating model and all the rest of it. And that's going to take time. And at the same time, the technology will, yes, rapidly evolve and there will be all kinds of new applications coming out, but that is on top of kind of incumbent businesses, right? Um, and I think that the topic du jour for me is, um, are we, when it comes to Gen AI, is this pace of change going to continue? Uh, because the industry says yes, right? Uh, and they all kind of go by the scaling hypothesis, which until now seems to be valid still, more compute, more data, and we're going to continue to increase performance. Uh, but there are also AI researchers that point to the inherent technology in generative AI, um, which make kind of the performance flaws that we see, hallucination or whatever they call it, a feature of the technology, and that won't change, they argue, uh, with, with scaling it even more, let alone the fact that at some point you run out of data. Um, so, and in that case, we will hit a plateau somewhere coming years. And is that a problem? No, not at all, because there's so much value to be created with what we got in the last few years uh, and how that has to be adopted by organizations and how organizations can innovate with that. So. It, to me, it doesn't really matter, right? Whether we hit the plateau or not. Obviously to the industry, yes, because at some point the valuation of open AI will, will drop probably if, if that's the case. Um, but to most, large, to most organizations globally, it's irrelevant. Mm -hmm.